Hey guys, welcome to Elevate. Uh, we're so excited to worship with you guys, but first we're gonna be starting with a game. So I'm gonna need two volunteers. Raise your hand high, super fun. <laughs> we got one on the way back. One! <laughs> It's not too embarrassing, I promise. In the way back, white shirt. <laughs> yep, yep, you, you go got ahead. it. You got it. <laughs> hey, did you pick one? Yeah, we got two. Oh, hello. Okay, so this game is called Light in the Dark. I'm just going to give you a minute to, for our contestants to get prepared. Okay, so even though we have two people up front, everyone in the audience can participate. This game is called Light in the Dark. We're gonna have a series of videos appear, and pretty much you're gonna have to figure out what it is before the time is up. A small portion of the image will be illuminated, and you have to shout it out when you see, when you realize what it is. So let's see our first one. Uh, Millennium Falcon. Millennium. Millennium Falcon. Okay, Millennium Hello. Falcon. Is this thing? I thought that one was pretty easy. Yeah. Grace I doesn't know what Star Wars is. Yet. I've never bad. seen Star Wars before in my life. Boo. Okay, what's our next one? Uh, Barney. Teletubbies. Barney. Barney. Oh, Barney. We get Teletubbies and Barney. Barney. Wait a minute. There's a discrepancy. Yeah, that's Barney. Okay, here we go. AirPods. AirPods. But are they the pro version? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have AirPods. What is it? Lion. Lion. Oh, there's something else oh, by it. Uh, Lion King. Pretty close. Lion King counts. Eiffel Did I hear Eiffel Power? No. I said Statue You didn't hear that. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. What flavor? Probably red Jeez. flavor. Cheese. <laughs> the, the original. <laughs> There's not many flavors of cheese. There's Jesus. only one flavor. Yeah, that one's the easiest one. I think this next one was the hardest one for me. Is it? Oh, Justin Bieber. There you go. There you go. He's got some tattoos in case you didn't notice. Clue. Oh, no. Friends? Friends? I have not seen Friends, I'm just being Ooh. honest. <laughs> What else we got? Lawnmower. Someone said lawnmower really early. Ooh. <laughs> what else we got? Buzz Lightyear. What was the giveaway? The colors. All right, that's it. You guys can have a seat and just put your mics back there. Thank you very much. Can you guys give them a round of applause? Some of those are tricky. Cheez-Its, easy. Friends, I, I haven't seen that show, so I was lost. I think we have a few announcements we're gonna move into. Did you guys know we're doing some broom ball next week? In case you didn't know, Whoa. instead of... <laughs> Instead of meeting here, we're going to be meeting at Prairie Knoll and playing broomball. We've got a short promo video we're going to be showing you. So let's tune in. Hi, everyone. We're going to be out of the broomball night. And here's a few things you need to know. about 
this event is because of a fundraiser for our global missions partners located in Haiti, India, and the DRC. It's not supposed to sound like that. You can also pay $10 at the door and be entered into a raffle to win an Apple Watch. You can also pay $5 for additional tickets. Uh, hey, maybe, maybe we'll just stop the video and I'll explain it. <laughs> That's okay. We It sounded way better the first time we tested that. So pretty much what you need to know, instead of coming here next week, we're going to be meeting at Prairie Knoll. We're going to play broomball, and it's a fundraiser. So you're going to bring $10, and you can be entered to win a brand new Apple Watch. And you're also able to buy additional raffle tickets for $5 a piece. All the proceeds go to supporting our missions partners. Because February, our church is doing this huge missions movement to support people in need. So it's going to be fun. It might be a little chilly, so bring a jacket, but we're going to have a fire. We're going to do some sledding, and we're going to support some people in need. So it'll be a great time. Yeah, thanks, Jared. And we have one other announcement. We are going back to Kansas City, Kansas, uh, June 19th through the 25th. It's our one mission trip for this summer, and spots are filling up. So if you are interested, pray about it and sign up on constantstreet.org. We also have a video for this one. Hopefully it's not as crackly this time. The strategic thing about Apex is that it's a missions trip that is kind of flipped in a way. You come here, and from day one, you're talking about what's going to happen when you get back home. Each Apex site for youth groups has uniqueness in the ministry that we do, whether we're doing a kids camp or we're doing service projects or serving in the community with our church partners. But it also has great cohesiveness in that we offer the same training at every location and the training really revolves around how do we be gospel influence when we go home. When I think of a mission trip, I definitely think of manual labor and doing things for others, but Apex is different in a sense because it's more of a training. They're training you to minister to your friends and giving you tools to better your follow with Christ. All the mission trips I've done before have been serving full time. This was serving in a way that I had not served before, yet also preparing me to serve back at home. Our group leaders here uh, have been phenomenal in their leading, in uh, their teaching. There's just been a lot of clarity that I've gained from this week. I don't think that I will ever be the same. I feel like I've definitely grown as a leader. Like so many things I didn't know that I know now and like getting comfortable talking to people about their faith. I think it's so important that like everyone gets an experience like this where they just get to love on others and just serve others and not like think about themselves. A week-long trip like this is perfect for students. This is a transformative time in their life, and these skills that they're learning with us will be skills that they'll be able to hone and even grow in as they get older and take on with the rest of their life. We often say that an apex trip for youth groups is about one week of service, one week of ministry, one week of training that leads to 51 weeks of gospel influence. As a youth pastor, I love that. I love the fact that our students are being equipped with tools to reach their friends back in Andover, Minnesota. We're spending a week in Kansas City, but we're, our focus is what's happening when we return. Um, how are we going to come alongside? How are we gonna encourage? How are we gonna love the students that we see every single day? Yeah, I am super excited for this summer, and just again, there's 30 spots, and we have about 10 people signed up already, so 
just if you're thinking about it, I totally think that you should just go on to constantstreet.org and fill out the application. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be an amazing time. So with that being said, we're now going to transition into a time of worship. But first, I want to pray for us. Jesus, I just want to thank you for the opportunity we have to gather and to worship. Um, and shortly, we're going to hear from Josiah as he's just sharing what you've placed on his heart. God, I ask that you would prepare our hearts to enter into this time and that uh, the busyness of school and just the different assignments we have that might be piling up or whatever's going on at home. God, help us to just set that stuff aside for this moment. God, help us to just be still and to hear what you have for us tonight. God, thank you for the gifted worship team, for the leaders. For God, thank you for every single student here. And I just pray that you would reveal yourself and make yourself known in this place right now. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, you guys are welcome to join us, stand up, and worship this evening. Your prayer. 
that up to you. God, help us make room. God, allow allow your spirit in. God, there's nothing more in this moment that matters other than you.
God, as attractive as money and popularity and social media likes, God, feel sometimes you are what matters. God, you're the one that tells us that we're enough when we feel lousy. You're the one that comes beside us when we don't know where to go, when we feel like there's nobody else out there for us. God, in this broken world, we just ask for you to come in. Just come into our life. As we listen to Josiah and these next few songs, I just pray for each and every one in this room, God, that you enter in in some way that'll just make a difference. Just even for a moment, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, hey, guys. Thanks so much, worship team. Can you guys give them a round of applause for their awesome worship? All right, well, I have a question for you guys. I, I asked the middle schoolers this last time, too. I want to know, like, the most fun thing someone thinks they've done in the last, like, month. Right? Because it's kind of, like, boring right now in some ways. So I want to hear what fun you guys are having. So who thinks they've done, like, the most fun thing in the room? Raise your hand. you got to be ready to yell it, though, because I want to hear it. Otherwise, I'll call on random people. And I know plenty of your names, so you better raise your hand if you're willing to share. Nobody at all. Gabby! Ice climbing? Like you climbed ice? Like a waterfall, okay, okay. I was like, like, how did you build ice? Okay, great, cool. That is really fun. I didn't even know that was something people did. Who else has an answer? You saw your cousin, they came to see you? Oh, so you don't see him that often. That's pretty fun, seeing family, there's one. A disc golf tournament? That's Daniel's winner for sure. All right. Any more? Okay, one more. You met a, a sloth? Oh my gosh, that sounds so fun. You guys must have an answer up here. No? She hasn't, okay, what's her answer? Is that what she actually said? No, that's not what she, okay, well, whatever. We'll let secrets be, that's fine. All right, well, those are some fun things. Um, I'm glad you guys are finding some ways to have fun. Um, something I like have been doing recently to have fun is I've been going with my good friend Tanner um, to different thrift, thrift stores, like Goodwill, like this interesting place in Anoka that I don't know how they make any money, but like just places have these interesting things. And I like to find like some of the weirdest things there and just, if it's under like five bucks, find it. Now, or buy it. There's been some cool things I found. Like I got these like National Geographic magazines that were published during World War I. And I, I think that's kind of cool. I wouldn't want to read about it in a history book, but seeing it in the magazine like, that was published at that time is kind of cool. Um, recently at Goodwill, I got this lovely Ten Commandments plaque. Um, I think it's gorgeous. I think it would make good decor, but Grace has said no, I cannot hang it up anywhere. It's already been a topic of conversation. So it is not hanging up in our house, but it's here and I'm happy about it. So we also have this fun clown statue that Tanner bought, like little little figurine that's currently on our coffee bar, you know, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but that's like my attempt, right, at finding something fun to do in a time that's kind of been meh, like bleh, like there's just not much going on compared to usual. Um, I think that it's, it's kind of become a time where it's easy to just be like bored. Like it's easy to just kind of feel like you're in a lazy river, <laughs> like you're laying in a tube and it's going around. That was cool for the first couple laps and then it's been like 10 or 11 months on the same river and you're like, okay, I'd like to be done now. Like a water slide would be fun or something, but it's still going. Um, I think next month is gonna be like the one year anniversary of 15 days to slow the spread. So that didn't age great. Um, but no matter what, no matter how long this goes, it's just, it feels like we're kind of in this bleh, 
right? At least to me. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are feeling that way too, where even the things we're doing that we used to do don't feel the same. And some things that we used to do, we just don't get to do at all anymore. Um, and that really is, it's kind of painful. There's been some losses there. Um, and it just kind of feels, like I said, like bleh, like nothing's going on. Um, so I want to go to a story in the Bible tonight of a group of people that were also in a period of waiting. Now, they're in a little bit different period of waiting. Um, I'm going to explain who they are in a second. But they were still in a situation where they were waiting for something to happen, and they were just kind of bleh. Like, there was no clear next step for them as a country. They're just kind of waiting. Um, so we're going to be turning to the book of Exodus tonight, which is the second book in the Old Testament. So the book of Exodus focuses on this one big event called the Exodus, appropriately. Um, they, it is focused on this event where God takes his people, the Israelites, the Jewish people, who were slaves in Egypt, and he makes them free. So he helps them to leave Egypt and go out to a land that he's calling them to, to be their own independent nation, to be his people with only them as their God, or with only him as their God. So that's kind of where we are. We've, we've seen God do these miracles, bring these plagues down on the Egyptians until they would free the Israelites. And then when the Egyptians chase them um, as they're leaving, God splits the river open so the Israelites can walk through on dry ground to the other side and then brings it back down to just crush the, uh, the Egyptian army. Um, so it's basically like they won a war they didn't even have to fight, right? God won it for them. So that's kind of where we're at. And now they've entered into this relationship with God um, by making a covenant with him. So God has said, you are going to be my people. I'm going to make a nation out of you, and I am going to use you to bless the people around you, bless the other people groups, and demonstrate my love and power to them. So that's kind of where we're at. And then Moses, their leader, the guy who led them out of Egypt, he is now up on a mountain, and he is talking to God about what, he, what God wants next for the people. So that's what we're going to jump into, Exodus chapter 32. We're going to read some verses. We'll start right in verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him, right? So like right now, we don't know what's happened to our normal lives. We don't know when it's coming back. We just, we hope it will, but we don't know when. They don't know when Moses is coming back. Verse 2, Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wife, that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. So already we see, like, what is number one on this, this plaque? You can't even read it. It says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, which is a really old way of saying, don't worship other things. And they already made a calf out of gold. They made their own thing to worship. They've already been distracted from worshiping this God who brought them out of Egypt, and they're already focusing their worship on something else. Let's continue into verse 5. When Aaron saw this, saw them worshiping, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in every revelry. So they're throwing this big party to worship this new god they've made, right? They're making these sacrifices, right? They're giving up their livestock and then giving them as burnt offerings to this fake god that they have made. These are the exact same offerings, the exact same celebrations they made just a few chapters ago in Exodus chapter 24, when they seal the covenant, when they make this promise to God by, by giving him these same offerings. They've already gone and done the same thing to a different God, not too far later. So we get to verse 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down. 
because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. They're stubborn. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them. Then I will make a great nation. I will make you into a great nation. So let's pause there. That's pretty heavy. That's pretty intense, right? God saying he's going to destroy this entire people group that were supposed to be his people. And I want to take a step back and I want us to put ourselves in God's shoes and think through why. Right? We can't know everything about God. We don't know every little detail about him. We don't understand all his power all the time. But we know he has feelings. He has emotions. He feels jealousy just like we do. So we've all felt the pain of betrayal or disappointment in another person or somebody breaking a promise to us or lying to us or just not giving us what we needed from them. So imagine how great God's pain must have been in this moment. Imagine what must be going through his head as he's seeing them worship this false god. And then imagine that emotion. He must be thinking, I just brought them out of Egypt. I just did all these miracles, brought all these plagues, won this whole war for them when they didn't even have to stand up to fight. I just did all these things for them, asking nothing in return except for their love and their worship to me because I did these things for them and I want them to be my people. I have this purpose and this plan for them and they're walking away from it. They already forgot about me. I can understand why God felt so disappointed. I think any of us would. And his, his righteous jealousy and anger is even stronger than any emotion we can ever experience, but we can understand that pain. <sighs> Let's look at verse 11. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land. I promise them and it will be their inheritance forever. So the Lord relented, and he did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. So this is pretty important, right? Moses steps in between the people and their sin and God. He steps in the middle and says, God, don't do this. These are your people. These are the people you love and you want to use as your people to show everybody around them your blessing and power. And God says, okay. He says, I'm not going to destroy them right now. I'm still going to use them as my people. We'll see later there are consequences, though. Let's move into verse 15. Moses turned from God and went down to the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant law. This is only one, but he had two. Two tablets of the covenant law in his hand. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablet. When Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there is the sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, it's not the sound of victory. It's not the sound of defeat. It's the sound of singing that I hear. When Moses approached the camp, and he saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned. And he threw the tablets. Ooh, ooh. Didn't, that, that wasn't supposed to go down there. But anyway, he throws the tablets and shatters them. I wish that would have shattered. That would have been so much better. But he destroys it. It's his anger and, ooh, imagine how the Israelites must have felt in that moment. 
Imagine the feeling of dread. Like, imagine the time you've been in the biggest trouble of your life for something you did, and you knew you were going to be in trouble for it, right? You just felt that dread inside of you. Imagine, like, the worst moment of dread you've ever felt in that way. You know, for me, I remember a story from when I was a kid. I was probably six, maybe seven. Um, I have a brother who's about a year and a half younger than I am, and we were playing in our front yard, and I was like, Connor, you know what you should do? You should grab a rock, and the next time a car drives by our house, you should throw the rock at that car. Don't know why I said that. Seven-year-old me thought that would be the funniest thing ever, and Connor did it. (laughs) He grabs a rock. Next car comes by. He chucks it, hits him right on the front of the car. Didn't really do any damage, but then the car stopped, and the people got out. I heard someone say, oh no, yes, oh no. The feeling of dread as I saw them walking towards our house is like, I will never forget that. I don't think I've ever experienced such a great feeling of dread again in my life. That's got to be still paling in comparison to the Israelites when they see Moses come down the mountain. That's got to just still be even so much worse than that because they know they've messed up, right? They know there's going to be consequences for what happened. Um... And I'm not going to read the rest of the story, but the rest of the chapter goes on to explain that Moses destroyed the calf. He burned it up into a fine powder, and he put it in the water and made the Israelites drink it. Ew. (laughs) That's so gross. I mean, it's still not as bad of a consequence as they deserved, but ew. I don't don't know what that is. Maybe there's a metaphor there about what happens after they die just their idol? I don't know. But anyway, um, the point is Moses destroys it. Um, He makes the people consume it, and then it's gone. And then it goes on, the chapter goes on, and there are consequences for what happened. Um, Those who still don't come back to the Lord after that are put to death. Um, There are thousands of people that die, and God sends a plague to his own people. um, Because they have done the most offensive thing possible to God they have worshiped another god they have turned away from him they've worshiped someone else and you know when i read this i I think i can kind of explain why it happened um yes we could go different angles with this we could talk about how we all have this kind of desire to not fully commit to god or how all of us have you know this flesh side of us that's holding us back from fully worshiping him but here's what i think happened i think they lost their understanding of what their purpose was. I think the Israelites were in this period of waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain, and without Moses there, without, you know, this this leader taking them step by step by step through what they were supposed to do, I think they lost their sense of purpose, right? I think they forgot their ultimate purpose, which was to be God's people, to be his family, to be his kingdom, right? They forgot this sense of purpose, that their purpose was to glorify God, to be an example of his love and power for all the people around them. But they forgot that. And as soon as you lose, as soon as they lose focus on that purpose, they start to try to fill that void with something else. They make their own purpose thinking that that's going to fill that void. They make their own God, thinking that if we make this purpose of creating a God and worshiping him, then we will be filled up again. We will have that same feeling that we had when we were following God. But they don't, right? There's consequences for it, and they're not a good consequence. They lose their sense of purpose, and then it leads to their destruction, and it leads to this big disaster. And guys, most of us probably haven't thrown our earrings in a fire and made a calf to worship. But I think we're all kind of at the bottom of the mountain. I think we're all kind of waiting, not for Moses, but I think we're kind of waiting for our feeling of normal life to come down to us. And the question is, what are we going to focus on in that waiting? Are we going to remember our purpose, our ultimate purpose? Are we going to remember who God created us to be? To be servants of him, to love others, to be an example of his blessing and love and commitment to those around us? Are we going to remember whose we are as we live out this purpose? Are we going to remember that we belong fully to God, 
whether things feel normal or whether things feel bleh? Are we going to remember what we're called to do to be a light in the world and to share our sense of purpose with people around us? Or are we going to forget our purpose? Are we going to say, just like they said, they said, we don't know when or if Moses is coming back, so we're just going to go do our own thing. Are we going to say, we don't know when or if our normal life is coming back, so we're just going to do our own thing? Or are we going to remain faithful to the purpose that we know God has created for our lives? See, there's people in this room who are at a few different places with this. So I want to talk to each, each group of you tonight. There's some of you who have found this purpose before, who have tried on this purpose of saying, my purpose in life is to love God, to be loved by God, and to connect with him and serve others around me. And some of you have found that purpose through your relationship with Jesus. And if you're living that out great right now, if you're feeling like I have this clear sense of my ultimate purpose and I'm living it out daily, great. Like more power to you. There's days I fall short of that. But more power to you if you are doing that. Now share that purpose with people around you. People need that sense of purpose and that sense of God's love if they're going to make it through this. If they're going to make it through this period of waiting at the bottom of the mountain, you have an obligation to share and remind them of that purpose so they can make it through. There's some of you who have found that purpose before, but aren't really feeling it now. You're kind of, you know, you've seen God's great work, you've seen him split the river, but now you're kind of like forgetting it. You know, you're not really reminding yourself of it and waking up every day and choosing to live out that purpose. And if that's you, you got to remember it. You got to come back to it. It's our ultimate purpose. We shouldn't just walk away from it. As we learn in tonight's story, there's disastrous consequences to that, right? And if you're not digging into this, if you're not connecting with God through his word, and if you're not connecting with him daily through prayer, you're not going to remember. You're not going to keep sticking to that sense of purpose. You're going to get lost. So if you have walked away from that purpose, come back to it. That's my challenge to you tonight. Come back to it. Because we don't know when normal is coming back down the mountain, but we know that we have a purpose we can still live out even while we're waiting. Finally, there's some of you in the room who have never found that sense of purpose, who have never felt that ultimate purpose that God has placed on our lives to be his children, to be a part of his family, to be a part of his kingdom, serving others around us, and being a light in the world so others may know the love of God. Some of you have never found that purpose. See, this, this whole season of waiting for normalcy to come down from the mountain, it's probably not going away quite yet. So I'm inviting you tonight. Try on the purpose of being God's person. Try on the purpose of serving the Lord each and every day. Try on the purpose of being a force for love in your community. Try that purpose on. Try it out. See if that can be a purpose that helps get you through this time, but not only get through it, but thrive in it. Right? Because that's what the power of God can do. So if you've never found that purpose, I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now because I want you to find it. Lord, we come before you tonight just as a people a little bit weary of waiting for our normal lives to come back down the mountain. And Lord, we know that might not happen right now. We know it might not happen very soon. We just don't know. We're just in a season of waiting, just like your people were waiting for Moses to come back. But Lord... We know that you have created a purpose for each and every one of us in this room and watching online. We know that you have made this purpose for us to love you and love others, to serve you with our whole hearts, to connect with you daily, and to share your sense of love with everybody we encounter. Lord, there are people in this room who have never had that purpose before. And I pray that they would just remember that just like how, you know, Moses stood between your anger for his people's mistake and the people, 
Lord, we have access to Jesus who stands between our mistakes and you. Lord, help us all who have not made that decision yet to try out that purpose of connecting with Jesus so that we can share your love with the world and so that we can thrive in this time of uncertainty. And Lord, for those of us who have found that purpose before, I pray that you never let a day go by where we don't feel a fire under us to connect with you and serve you and love you and be your people. Lord, we know that just as you had a plan to show your love to the world through the Israelites, that now you have a plan to show your love to the world through us. And I just pray that no matter how we're doing right now, no matter how we're feeling right now, Lord, that you would allow us to live out that purpose. I pray that we never get so comfortable that we forget our purpose. And I pray that your love would just continue to compel us forward so that we would just take steps every day to share you with those around us. I ask this all in Jesus' name.
Thanks so much for joining, guys. Um, we are going to be going off into small groups. And for those who are online, uh, connect with your small group leader for further uh, connections. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>